지남대교 광명입니다. 이거 영어로 해야 뭐지? 저 영어로 해야 되는 우리말로 해야 되는. It's my great pleasure to introduce my academic brother, actually, Michael Jolly from Indiana University. Uh, 1987년도에 미네소타에서 학위했고요. 저하고 같은 지대 교수입니다. 그 다음에 그 어디 프린스턴하고 미네소타에서 포탁하시다가 1989년도부터 인디아나 대학에 계속 지금 근무하고 계십니다. 근, 그 학위 후로 한, 한 30년 동안 그 시프란 포야스 교수하고 계속 그걸 같이 하, 하고 계시거든요. 근데 그뭐 많은 분야도 그렇지만요. 제일 핫 이슈가 디멘션 리덕션입니다. 물론 뭐, 그, 하이어 디멘션에서 로우 디멘션도 중요하지만은, 그보다 더 어려운 것이, 인피니 디멘션에서 파란 디멘션을 저도 뭐한 30년 하고 있는데, 잘안 되더라고요. 이번에 그 같이 어떻게 하려고 불렀는데, 이번 주 같이 있다가 이렇게 겹쳐가지고, 그 제가 모셨습니다. 어, 이, 음. He will give talk today. It's titled "Determining Forms and Data Assimilation." Please welcome Michael Jolly. Come over here. Thank you, Minkyu, for both a very nice introduction, which I didn't really understand, but also for your generous hospitality. I have to say that I've been impressed by so many people here who come up to Minkyu and greet him as such a great friend. And it's not possible that they all owe him money. So I believe the affection is general, is, is genuine. And I have to say that everybody here is very welcoming. So it is a great pleasure to be back in Seoul and to speak in front of so many Korean mathematicians. So I will define all these terms. Data assimilation, I will demonstrate at the beginning. I'll define what I mean by a global attractor, since looking at the list of talks here doesn't seem like anyone much beyond MinQ and I are concerned about these things. Inertial manifolds as well. And these new objects, which are called determining forms. So let me just start with a differential equation. And even if you're a topologist, you've probably seen a differential equation. And the motivation for a data assimilation algorithm is the following. Let's, let's talk about the weather. So the problem, aside from the fact that it's a very complicated system, is that we don't know how to start our simulations. We don't have a complete picture of the entire atmosphere and all the variables that play into it. We only have discrete information at certain weather stations, which are measuring, say, the velocity and the temperature and the pressure, these things. So we don't know how to start our simulations, let alone, OK, it's a very big system. On the other hand, we can use the information that is coming from these discrete locations over time. It's not simply starting at one value. We know a lot of data over a long period of time. And so the idea behind data assimilation is to inject a time series of data into the model and force it to approach the correct behavior even though we don't know how to start it exactly. Right? So I'm putting on the screen here two differential equations. The one on the top 
is the basic model. The one underneath it is what we're going to use to drive the solution to the correct solution. So we can call the solution to the top the reference solution. And the solution to this, I've noted with a sub V for a while, right? So you'll notice that we're putting the solution to the correct model, the correct solution, the reference solution, we're putting that into this model. Right? Now this J represents some sort of projection because we don't know the data everywhere. We know it only at a, say, a finite number of points. So it's like a, a finite dimensional projection of the correct weather or whatever U represents. Right? And you'll notice that there is a, a parameter here to play with, this mu. Right? And the fact is that under certain conditions on this projection and this mu, we can force the solution to this system to approach the correct system using only partial information about the true reference solution. So that's the idea behind data assimilation. All right, now let me talk for a while about a particular system. It's not the weather system, although in some sense it forms a fundamental simple part of it. So this is called the Rayleigh-Bernard system, right? So it's not an ordinary differential equation anymore. It's a partial differential equation, but the essence of it is the same. You see two components, actually. The first one represents velocity. That's u. And never mind about all these terms. This is essentially the momentum equation. It's described by Navier-Stokes. And there's just a special force here which uses theta, which is the temperature. Right? So this couples the temperature and the, the velocity in a very particular way. This condition just says that the velocity as a vector is divergence free. And there are some specific boundary conditions. The ones that I'm expressing here are after some sort of shift in the variables. Normally for Rayleigh-Bernard, you would heat below and you would cool on top, and this drives some sort of convection that you often see in the atmosphere. In fact, we will just assume that we are periodic in the horizontal direction, and we are um, zero on the top and zero on the bottom after, as I say, change of variables. So from the first technical slide I showed you with two differential equations, now I show you two sets of differential equations. This represents what gives you the reference solution or the true solution. And this one with sub v's everywhere. It's, it's just like this one, except I've put sub v's. And now I have added this extra term. But one thing that I want you to notice is that I do it only in one component. I do it only in the equation for velocity, not in the temperature. And the point is that it's possible to recover not only the velocity in this way, but you recover also the temperature, provided that this parameter in front of this feedback force, if you will, is large enough and in turn, having taken that large enough, you have to take H small enough in order to satisfy a certain condition. Then you'll get that UV approaches U and the temperature approaches the temperature sub V as time goes to infinity. In fact, it does it at an exponential rate, so it does it rather quickly. Now, the simplest case is if we use what are called Fourier modes. That is, we expand in a Fourier series these unknown functions of space. And I'll just take you through a couple of steps.
because it shows how we have to determine how closely the, temp the velocity is measured. So you don't necessarily have to work in partial differential equations to follow these steps. So first of all, we take this term which is going to appear in our next calculation and we add and subtract W. This parentheses here, these represent the L2 inner product. And so by putting a W and a minus W, we are subtracting mu times, uh, adding actually, mu times the L2 inner product. And here we correct for it, so we have equality. And then we're just going to use Cauchy-Schwartz inequality on this. And then you can use what's called Young's inequality, or what everybody knows, two times a product is less than or equal to the sum of the squares. That's all this is. And so we're using the fact that this projection here satisfies a certain inequality in terms of the L2 norm and the H1 norm. This is a Sobolev norm. It's basically the derivative of W, okay? So we went from L2 to the L2 of the derivative. Okay, and then finally we're going to use this assumption here to replace mu h squared by nu over 2. This is viscosity which appears in the momentum equation. Okay, so how does this fit into the big scheme of things? What we did is we just derived this. That's all we did, all right? But the way we're going to apply it is we are looking at the difference, we want to make this go to zero and simultaneously this go to zero, the difference in our velocities and the difference in our temperatures. So we take the equation for the difference in velocities, call it the W equation, and you take the L2 inner product with W, and then we take the um, L2 inner product with the difference of temperature, you use this relation, and you, after a few steps, you arrive at this relation here where you're looking at a time derivative of the quantity you want to make small. You have a positive term in front of that quantity, and that is less than or equal to some big mess. And the whole idea is that if you take mu and you make it big enough, because it has this minus sign, you can make this whole expression negative, or zero would be good enough. So you can drop it, and then of course, the one differential equation all calculus students see is the one whose solution is the exponential function, the linear equation. And so in fact, if you take mu big enough so that this disappears, you'll see that this quantity in parentheses will decay like an exponential function. So it, it goes to zero exponentially fast, you approach the reference solution at an exponential rate. Now that's fine, except maybe this is unrealistic. Maybe we are asking for too sharp a resolution. And the amount of resolution we need is going to be decided by this condition where we said, okay, let's take mu big enough. We gotta take mu bigger than all this stuff. Maybe we can't afford to put weather stations so many places. So let's just assume this is the worst term. And I'm saying that because these quantities you expect to be small, viscosity, and this is a diffusion coefficient, and the fact that you've got a fourth power on this norm, which might be fairly large. So I have yet to introduce these physical parameters, but there's something called the Prandtl number, which compares the viscosity to the diffusion coefficient. So let's assume this is about one. That's a common situation. That's about the case for water. And so if you make that assumption, then this other parameter, which is well known for this problem, the Rayleigh number, 
if you take mu and kappa to be about the same, then you look at this term down here and you've got Rayleigh to the three halves. You're asking that this parameter be bigger than Rayleigh to the three halves times something else, which might very well be big. All right? You need to satisfy this condition as well. So if you then incorporate the best estimates we know for this term, which are from a paper by Foyash, Manley, and Tamam, unfortunately, it's exponential. Exponential in the viscosity to the minus seventh power. Now, viscosity is small, so B is big. And it, moreover, is in an exponential. So this is a nightmare. We are asking that mu be bigger than this outrageous quantity. And to just give you a feel, we're talking Rayleigh numbers in applications that are on the order of a million. So this is telling us that, OK, we have to have our points in space on the globe very close together, closer than we could achieve if our estimates are sharp. Fortunately, they're not. Right? This is analysis. And while it gives you a guide for what might work, it, you can't take, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Right? OK, so maybe it's hopeless, but let's do some computations. And we'll see, in fact, that if we carry out the computations, it works much better than suggested by these estimates. We don't need to have the points so close together. Now, the computations are done on the same problem, but it's repackaged a little bit because it's more efficient to, in the case of the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, which is the momentum equation, to, instead of velocity, write an equation for the vorticity up here, this omega. right? And then you get a very similar looking system in terms of omega. And so omega now and theta form our reference solution. And down here, we are driving it with the given omega. So I put an omega sub u on the reference solution here. That's what comes out of this. And again, we're not driving the temperature. We're only driving the vorticity or knowledge of the velocity. So to demonstrate this, I have to start on some solution. This is what we're starting with. And what I'd like to do is now show a video. So as you can see, we are taking the Rayleigh number quite big. It's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the seventh. I said we'd take the Prandtl number about 1. In fact, we'll take it to be exactly 1. And the length of this domain is 2. The height is 1, if you're keeping score. Now, the reference solution will be calculated with 192, effectively 192 points horizontally. That's equivalent to using 192 Fourier modes, expanding in a Fourier series with 192 terms. Likewise, in the vertical direction, we are using 96 points. And those are done with what are called Chebyshev modes, but it's equivalent to taking 96 points. But they're not evenly distributed. The data uses only half the Fourier modes. It's using all the Chebyshev modes. That's true in this movie. All right. Can you start it over again? OK. Thank you. Just stop it and go back to the beginning. Great. OK. Uh, so. On the left at the top, you have the vorticity field. So this corresponds to velocity, but it's all incorporated into a scalar quantity. So we don't have to draw a vector at each point in the plane. And down here, we have the temperature field, which of course is a scalar, in our domain, which goes from, uh, say, 0 to 2, 
in zero to one. Over here we have what we have initially and that is no knowledge of what the solution should be. But we want to solve this system, we want to demonstrate that this works, so we're going to let the weather evolve as it should, that's one system evolving, and then we are going to drive it, drive the second system in order to make this approach this. Okay, so go ahead, thank you. You can see our progress here. This is not done uh, in real time. This is in slow motion. In fact, it only takes about 0.0072 seconds to get from one end of this time to the other. But it very quickly starts to look like the reference solution. And at the very end, it's almost identical. And not only that, but it's doing it at the right pace. It's doing it in the same time frame. Almost done. At the very end, you, if you look carefully enough, you can see they haven't quite converged to the eye, but they're very close. Okay. Thank you. I think I will switch to the next one for the sake of time. So the takeaway from that is, uh, yes, data assimilation can work. In some situations, it can work on just using data from one component. But the main point is that you can do these estimates, and they could be very pessimistic, yet data assimilation can work much better than expected. So now let me talk about something that at first seems completely different, but uh, actually is inspired by that data assimilation approach. So I got to back up and I have to define some things. Um, so I'm going to write the system here in a more abstract way. So it looks like an ordinary differential equation, but technically it's not. Strictly speaking, it is not an ordinary differential equation. And that's because it's in a Banach space and we're going to, when we apply this, we're going to be talking about an unbounded operator here. Nevertheless, even though the phase space for this is this infinite dimensional Banach space, um, for many problems of this type, it has what is called an absorbing ball, meaning that all solutions eventually enter and remain inside a ball of finite radius. And not only that, but there is this compact set called the global attractor. This global attractor has all the long time behavior of the system, it has points that don't move, steady states as they're called, or equilibria. It has limit cycles, that is purely periodic in time solutions, or in phase space, solutions which come back to themselves. As I said, it is compact. And you can also think of it as the set which is defined as having exactly the solutions that are bounded backward in time. Periodic solutions are bounded backward in time. Of course, steady states are bounded backward in time. All right. Okay. So that's what we mean by the global attractor. And now let me go back to a partial differential equation here, the Navier-Stokes equations. This was the momentum equation, essentially, that was the first component of our Bernard system. So we can write it in this form. You can identify the pieces in this case. This nonlinear term, B, is the projection of this so called inertial term. And the A in this case is what is called the Stokes operator, minus the Laplacian. We are in periodic boundary conditions on uh, a domain in L2, a, a box in L2. And there's a, a parameter here that we like to play with. It's called the Grashoff number. It, 
incorporates the L2 norm of the force, the viscosity, and the smallest wave number of the uh, operator A. It's a dimensionless number which is uh, very, very useful for measuring the complexity of the behavior. The bigger the Grashof number gets, the more complicated the behavior of this system gets. How did I skip inertial manifolds? I skipped this slide. Yeah, all right. So, what is an inertial manifold? It is a exponentially attracting finite dimensional invariant manifold. So, exponentially attracting means if you start off it, you will quickly get attracted to it. Invariant means if you start on it, you never leave it. And, of course, we know what finite dimensional is. Smooth, we'll say at least Lipschitz smooth. All right. So if you take our system, now you, you may have noticed that I was writing the general system with a time variable S, and now I write it with a dot, effectively. So this represents du ds. This is common notation for differential equations. And it's important to kind of keep an eye on the time variable. In the, we often have an expression dotting the I's and crossing the T's, right? Well, here we're dotting the S in effect. So with an inertial manifold, what you can do is you can write this system as a pair of equations, which are coupled. They're coupled through the nonlinear term. And if, in fact, this inertial manifold is the graph of a function, call it psi, you can replace the q here in the first equation with that function. And now what you've done is you've replaced an infinite dimensional differential equation with a finite dimensional differential equation. This now is truly an ordinary differential equation. The problem is that this, there we go, that this system, the Navier-Stokes equations, it, it's not known yet whether it has such a manifold. It was actually the inspiration for the notion of an inertial manifold. That's where the name inertial comes from. But it's been open now for over 30 years whether this has an inertial manifold. So we're, we're going to compromise. Instead of coming up with a finite dimensional ordinary differential equation which captures all the behavior of this system, we instead are going to come up with an infinite dimensional differential equation, but one which is ordinary. And by ordinary, I mean that the right-hand side is a Lipschitz function, which in a sophomore course in differential equation is what you use to prove existence of a solution. And this equation should allow you to identify elements on the global attractor of the original system. Okay. So the main idea behind this comes from something called determining modes or nodes or determining whatever, okay? And this idea goes back quite a ways to 1967 in a paper by Foyash and Prodi. This looks a little faint to me. There should be a shadow of these two curves. So these two curves represent solutions. And the point is that if this projection, if we're calling J, is what we call a determining projection, and these two solutions are on the global attractor, this can't happen. And it turns out that for the Navier-Stokes equation, even though we don't have an inertial manifold, there are a finite, it does have a finite dimensional determining projection, and it's on the order of the Grashof number, that parameter that I said is 
so useful. So you can think of it this way. Each trajectory on the global attractor is a noodle and you can't have one noodle like directly on top of the other with respect to your projection. Now that's naturally the case in a plate of spaghetti or the noodles we had at lunch, right? So our goal now is to extend what is naturally a, a, a map that data assimilation provides from the plate of spaghetti, that is these individual trajectories, to an entire space because it is on a space that we can define a differential equation. So I continue writing it with this S. So there's our system again. And now we see our old friend where we are providing this feedback force. But instead of putting in the reference solution or some solution of the original system, we are putting in some arbitrary element in this space. This is a Bonnock space of bounded functions with perhaps more than a zero derivative. I leave that open for now. From the reals into some projected space. So this is a finite dimensional space here with this projector J. And let's suppose that we have three ingredients on hand, namely that this system, even if we put in an arbitrary function like this, has a unique bounded solution. This is something you have to prove. And moreover, if the soup norm of V is controlled, you are controlling the soup norm of W. All right, that's reasonable. Also, that this now forms a map we call capital W, and that this map be locally Lipschitz. And it has this property that if we replace V with the projection of what I've been calling a reference solution, something that's on the global attractor of your original system, then this just spits back out that same solution. Now I'll introduce the determining form of a second kind, which looks like it has no connection whatsoever with the original system except through this mapping W. Yet it has the properties that it is a true ordinary differential equation. And this is because this is now going to be globally Lipschitz on a ball of a certain radius, which is forward invariant. That is, if we start on the ball, we stay in the ball. And so it's globally Lipschitz as far as that ball con is concerned, and we never leave it. Moreover, we can identify solutions on the global attractor as steady states of this new system, which will occur in one of two ways. Either V has to be equal to some chosen steady state, the projection of some chosen steady state, or it's making this expression zero. Every solution of this will go to a steady state. So every solution is going to something connected to the original system. I know we got a little behind. I don't know how much time I really have. Hmm? I go five more? OK, that's fine. Yeah, I can stop at any time. <laughs> I can go another hour, but I won't. All right. OK, so this is a determining form we call of the second kind. That suggests there's one of the first kind, at least. There's actually one of the third kind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's just my terminology. I will not get to the first kind. But one strange thing going on here is that you've got really two time variables. You want to think of them as time variables. There is the evolutionary time, tau, 
and then there is the original time, which we've been calling S. Now, that's not so strange, except it involves two time-like variables. But we do this all the time in partial differential equations. For example, when we think of the Navier-Stokes equations with the time variable being S, unspoken here is the fact that these operators, this Laplacian, this gradient operator, that these are with respect to a spatial variable. That's why it's a partial differential equation. There's more than one independent variable. So at each time s, when we write u of s, we are thinking u of s and x, and we're just suppressing the x when we write an equation like this. So likewise, when we write this determining form, we are suppressing the first time variable. But at each instant in the evolutionary time tau, we have a function that depends on s in time. So this was indeed carried out for the Navier-Stokes equations. I told you we had a little recipe to follow and we proved each of those items. The particulars here aren't important, but I told you that there was some k perhaps to choose and in that case we had to choose k equal to 1. And the size of the ball turns out to be the Grashof to the seventh. But these are just details. We have also carried this out for what is called the damped driven nonlinear Schrodinger equation. The analysis in this case and in the damped KDV case ends up being a little different. You cannot just use simple norms in your analysis. You have to take compound functionals. But that just gives you an excuse for doing it for other problems. And also for what's called the surface quasi-geostrophic equation, which again involves yet different techniques. All right. So let's see how I can wrap this up. Okay, I'll just fast forward. There. All right. So to summarize. As I said, data assimilation can work much better than the estimates suggest. We can embed the attractor, say, of the Navier-Stokes or some of these other systems in a determining form, which is an ordinary differential equation on trajectories. So in fact, the dimensionality of the determining form, though it's infinite dimensional, we have traded a continuum in space with a continuum in time. So in some sense, the fact that the data assimilation works better than the estimates suggest, even though it's not going to turn this determining form into a finite dimensional system, it somehow reduces one sense of its dimension. There are several determining forms. I've shown you only one. Right? We know the dynamics of this form, perhaps. We don't know the dynamics of a third kind, but the third kind, which I will not have time to show you, uh, may be useful for removing noise from a signal. That is, I can start with some nearby trajectory. These determining forms evolve trajectories. So even though this is a noisy signal, it will evolve it toward, in fact, the correct signal. That's one way I think we can apply these objects. Otherwise, it's not uh, yet known what the applications can be, but uh, we hope we can find some more. And with that, I'll finish. Thanks. Uh. Yeah, I got a question. So you showed a picture showing that your, your solution converges to, to the reference solution. Uh, 
Yes. So if I understand correctly, you have added this uh, fluctuation, namely this projection term. There you re re require the knowledge of the solution U. Yes. So, so your reference solution is fitted into that system as a U, right? Yes. So in which case then, how would you apply this to actual system? In, in reality, you don't know the reference solution or mm. you don't have the exact solution either. So how would you apply? You, you don't have the exact solution, but you assume that you have a projection of the exact solution. Okay. Say, projected onto a discrete set of points in physical space. That okay. represents the projection. So these are the weather stations. Right. And you not only have it at a single instant in time, you have it probably going back 10, 20 years. So this long time series you have for the reference solution, which is not the complete solution, it's only at certain points, that is, that is what I call JU. Okay. So you don't know the whole solution, but you know it at certain points, and you know a projection of it. Yeah. But it seems that from the experiment, when, whenever you have finite energy, by adding this fluctuation, that gives an exponential decay of your you know, solution, I mean the difference. So somehow, yeah. Yes, yeah. OK, thank you. Sure. Thank you.